Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panikar, for that sh short uh, introduction. And uh, with that, I think uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Where is it? Yes. What is this? At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizer, Dr. Rajiv Chawla and Dr. Shali Jaggi, for having given me this uh, opportunity to be a part of this wonderful conference. And uh, uh, it has been really, really very informative and educative. I was I joined the session last year, last day. Yesterday, it was wonderful. So I congratulate them for this wonderful organization of this con conference. But well, my today's brief is to talk about uh, uh, diabetes and inflammation. So let's start with this. And uh, the diabetes, as you all know, is, has, is uh, spreading the world over at an epidemic proportion, more so in developing countries like India. According to WHO, it was the population of diabetes was about 108 million in 1980. And it, by 2014, it had increased to 422 million. And according to the IDF, by 2021, we had 537 million diabetics living the world over. And the projection is that the number would increase to 220, uh, 6, 643 million by 2030 and 783 million by 2045. This is a huge, huge increase in the number of diabetics. And uh, I, I, what, what really has changed? Definitely, it has not the genes of ours which have, which have not changed over the last 100,000 years. It is we people who have changed. We have developed a very sedentary lifestyle. We are more stressed out. We have plenty to eat and plenty to eat the very wrong kind of food which you can see over here. So all this has led and uh, it took us ages to evolve to uh, this stage. But only a few decades to evolve to this stage where we developed a uh, lapot belly and central obesity because of our wrong kind of habits and uh, eating habits and uh, sedentary lifestyle, not because of change in our genes. And believe me, this waste is truly, truly hazardous. It is, it is, it is responsible for contributing to increased inflammation, both systemic and vascular, increasing the risk of insulin resistance, hypertension, and diabetes, as we'll be discussing in the coming slides. So as uh, the, 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 the adipose tissue earlier was just considered to be a storage depot for the fat in the form of triglycerides and in the fat state, and it used to release the fuel in the form of fatty acid and glycerol when there was fasting. But now the concept has changed completely. It is now considered to be a very active secretory or endocrine organ. It releases multiple bioactive substances, which, which, have, which have a significant effect on the structure and function of other, uh, several other organs. And uh, as you can see here, this is a list of whole whole lot of uh, uh, secretory or the active uh, factors or uh, adipose coins, as we call them, released by the uh, adipose tissue, which contributes to increase in both systemic and vascular inflammation, increase the risk of uh, hypertension, atherogenic dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, uh, type 2 diabetes, thrombosis, and atherosclerosis. Uh, let's have a look at the key adipose coins. Uh, the adiponectin. Uh, which is unfortunately decreased in, in intra-abdominal obesity, is, uh, is anti-atherogenic and anti-diabetic. It decreases foam cell formation, decreases vascular remodeling, increases, increases insulin sensitivity, and decreases hepatic glucose output. But unfortunately, its levels are decreased. On the other hand, uh, the inflammatory, inflammatory molecules, the interleukin-6 um, and TNF-alpha, their, their levels are increased. They are both pro-atherogenic and pro-diabetic. Uh, they, they increase the vascular inflammation, decrease insulin signaling, and decrease insulin sensitivity in the adipose side. Whereas the uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, its levels are also increased, which is again pro-atherogenic and pro-coagulant. So from this, you can make out that the, 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 these uh, um, uh, adipokines, the levels change in such a way that they, the whole scenario is more pro-atherogenic and pro-diabetic. As you can see over here, uh, the, the, the risk of developing diabetes in this nurses' health study um, carried out in the USA from 1986 to 1994, it was seen that the risk of developing diabetes increases linearly with the increase in the waist circumference. A woman having a waist circumference at 90th per percentile had a five times more risk of developing diabetes compared to female having a, a waist circumference of 
at at the tenth percentile. So the increasing obesity does does make a difference. As you can see over here, inflammation has a is linked to several diseases: rheumatoid arthritis, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and even pre-diabetes. As you all know, that as far as the risk of uh, by developing microvascular complications is concerned, the clock starts ticking once you develop diabetes. But the risk, as far as the risk of macrovascular complications is concerned, the clock starts ticking much before that in the pre-diabetic stage. If you see what is happening in, at this in this level, you see the insulin levels are still high, but yes, they have started declining. Uh, the plasma glucose levels are in the non-diabetic range. They, they may be higher than normal, but still not in the diabetic range. It is the insulin resistance which is peaked and plateaued off at this stage, which is high. So this increase in insulin resistance is responsible for uh, hyperinsulinemia, endothelial dysfunction, developing hypertension, hyperglycemia, atherogenic uh, dyslipidemia, increased inflammation, impaired fibrinolysis and hypercoagulability, all promoting atherosclerosis. So uh, let's have a brief look at the uh, insulin transduction pathway. In this, you see the uh, these uh, PI3K phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase uh, pa signaling pathway is responsible for uh, regulating the glucose metabolism at the skeletal muscle, adipose tissue and liver level. And also, Promotes the uh, release of nit nitric oxide, which is a which relax, which is a vascular relaxant from the endothelial cell. Whereas the MAP kinase pathway, the other signaling pathway, is responsible for promoting growth and mitogenesis, and also release of endothelium one, which is a vasoconstrictor from the endothelium. In diabetic, due to the insulin resistance is pathway selective. It is the the pathway selective insulin resistance is to the phosphatidyl inositol three kinase signaling pathway. So it this leads to uh, impaired glucose metabolism and hyperglycemia and decreased release of nitric oxide. So there's imbalance between the vasoconstriction and the vaso relaxation uh, elements. So as you can see over here, the endothelial dysfunction develops in this uh, in this situation. There is decreased enols, decreased in nitric oxide production, increased nitric nitric oxide degradation. Increased endothelin release, so nitric oxide bioavailability goes down. There is increased expression of the adhesion molecules. There is the macrophage uh, uh, migrate to, to the subendothelial tissue is enhanced, and further over there they release the inflammatory uh, cytokine that is TNF alpha, interleukin one, beta, interleukin six. There is smooth muscle. Uh, cell proliferation, there is increased platelet ag aggregation, vasoconstriction, and vascular permeability, all responsible for increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So, we can see that diabetes is not only a metabolic disease, but also a vascular disease. As you can see over here, the balance is very much tilted in favor of vasoconstriction, growth promotion, prothrombotic pro pro thrombotic state, pro inflammatory, and pro oxidant. So, <laughs> other key mechanisms which have been suggested are uh, for regulating inflammation in diabetes are hyperglycemia and elevated free fatty acid promote inflammation mm -hmm. by stimulating glucose uh, utilization along with alteration and oxidative phosphorylation. This induces a pro-inflammatory trait in the macrophages residing in, or residing or invading in the adipose tissue and other tissues including islet and vasculature. There is increased glucose, the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity might also exert oxidative and endoplasmic reticulum stress. This elicits an inflammatory response by increasing the release of active interleukin B1 beta. And then uh, interleukin 1 beta further amplifies inflammation by inducing the expression of various cytokines and chemokines. Obesity itself is associated with alteration in the gut microbiome along with increased gut leakiness of bacterial wall, lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, that may further promote inflammation. And the RAS or renin angiotensin system also plays a role in inflammation, insulin resistance, and vascular damage. The angiotensin 2 has been shown to induce expression of uh, chemokine monocyte, chemotrectin protein 1, MCP1, and also increase in the IL-6, interleukin-6, leading to impaired mitochondrial function and insulin secretion, as well as increased beta cell apoptosis. So here you can see uh, what happens in uh, the hyperglycemic state when the glucose levels are high in the blood. In the cells, 
which are prone, which are uh, the, 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 which which are not able to dis dysregulate the entry of glucose into them. In them, there is uh, increased mitochondrial overproduction of uh, superoxide, which damages the DNA and act activates the poly ADP rises, uh, polymerase, which further inhibits the key gly glycolytic enzyme glyceraldehyde three phosphate dehydrogenase, leading to uh, accumulation of the upstream molecules in the glycolytic cycle, which activate the four major pathways of hyperglycemia damage, namely the polyol pathway, the exosamine pathway, the protein kinase C pathway, and the H pathway. The activation of all these four pathways further leads to molecular damage, oxidative stress, increased inflammatory response, and change in the gene expression. So you can see inflammation uh, contributes both to insulin increase insulin resistance and decrease in the insulin secretion, thus further worsening the diabetes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, the, there is a, a strong correlation between the uh, levels of insulin, uh, this inflammatory markers and uh, insulin resistance. And the level of these insulin markers are increased in the group of uh, people who are, group of subjects who are likely to have, likely to develop diabetes in the near, in the future. As several prospective studies have compared, have, said, have studied the level of CRP, white cell count and uh, other inflammatory markers and uh, have found that the, the increased level of these inflammatory markers increases the risk of uh, developing diabetes in future in certain groups, which, which independent of other predictors. So you can see over here that uh, obese and overweight adults, obese or overweight children, westernized South Indians, Pima Indians, subjects without family history of type 2 diabetes, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, <coughs> and sedentary individuals, are the groups at risk of diabetes characterized by elevated circulating levels of inflammatory markers. <coughs> as far as evidence is concerned, there's ample of evidence available all over the world as far as uh, to, to suggest that type 2 diabetes is an inflammatory disease. We have uh, obesity, diabetes link, and we have Indian evidence also presented by Dr. Ghosh et al. And he suggested that West, uh, VAD, that is vascular, vis visceral adipose tissue, is a seat of chronic low-grade inflammation. Cameron and adipokine initiates inflammation by recruiting plasma cytoid dendritic cells into the VAD. This induces production of type 1 interferons and pro-inflammatory polarization of uh, adipose tissue adipose right and macrophages leading on to adipose tissue <coughs> excuse me adipose tissue and systemic insulin resistance and, and then you get there's enough data to suggest the key role of uh, tnf alpha in insulin resistance of obesity and, and uh, type 2 diabetes the tnf alpha expression has been found to be elevated in adipose tissue of multiple experimental models of obesity it is. It is. It, this is. Anti, this is a potent inhibitor of insulin-stimulated tyrosine phosphorylation on the beta cell chain of insulin receptor and the IRS1, suggesting a defect at, at or near the tyrosine kinase activity of insulin receptor by uh, this TNF alpha. So, uh, it says neutralization of TNF alpha may may improve the improves the insulin sensitivity. So uh, inflammation as is also uh, is a key uh, factor for uh, increasing the macrovascular complications. The pro-inflammatory conditions such as oxidized LDL, uh, advanced glyc glycosylation end products, they increase the secretion of the inflammatory markers, which influence all the process of atherogenesis from increased monocyte adhesion to endothelial cell to increase risk of atherosclerotic park rupture. And uh, suggested in this uh, comp complication of diabetes addition by Dr. Rajiv. In this, it, the, the hyperglycemia is also linked to increases for CAD. And you can see over here, hyperglycemia leads to increased age formation, PKC activation, and oxidative stress, as we have just discussed. Further, there is insulin resistance leads to hyperinsulinemia, increase the activation of MAP kinase signaling pathway, and uh, the PI3 kinase pathway is selectively signaling is, uh, resistances to, to this uh, signaling pathway. All this cumulatively leads to a dyslipidemia, a prothrombotic state, and endothelial dysfunction, injury, 
skin inflammation as we have discussed in the previous slides due to smooth muscle cell proliferation and eventually to increase atherosclerosis. Again, there, there is the relation of there is a strong relationship of inflammation with diabetic retinopathy. Again, the same path you can see hyperglycemia, age formation, and, uh, and uh, nitric oxide synthesis dysregulation, increased reactive oxygen species, activation of nuclear factor, kappa, which is a transcription factor, leading to activation of increased secretion of TNF alpha, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6, various chymokines, adhesion molecules, and INOS, and leading on to endothelial cell activation and recruitment of inflammatory cells, eventually leading to increased vascular permeability and new vascularization. Similarly, the inflammation is linked with diabetic nephropathy is also there. So it leads to studies have shown that relationship between pro-inflammatory cytokines and diabetic nephropathy. These are the cytokines. Cytokines are synthesized by the endothelial, mesangial, glomerular, and tubular epithelial cells. The interleukin-1 enhances the proliferation of mesangial cells and matrix synthesis increase vascular permeability, leading to development of intraglomerular microcirculatory uh, abnormalities. The interleukin-6 has a strong association with mesangial cell proliferation, increase in fibronectin expression and enhance endothelial permeability. The interleukin-18 uh, induces the production of other inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1, interferon alpha and TNF. Due to cytotoxic action towards glomerular, mesangial, and epithelial cells, the TNF alpha may induce significant renal damage. The transforming growth factor beta 1 contributes to cellular hypertrophy and increased synthesis of collagen, which has a which have a fibrogenic effect. Similarly, in diabetic neuropathy, diabetes induces hyperglycemia, activation of all these pathways, which we have already discussed, leads to vasoconstriction, endoneural hypoxia. Uh, nerve to conduction velocity impaired, leading to degradation and exonal structure. Uh, the sources from Dr. Rajiv Chawla compilation of diabetes complications. And then uh, let's see what, what is the evidence that we have that targeting these uh, inflammation in diabetes has any benefit. Uh, what are the newer therapeutic options? HCQS is an anti, has anti-inflammatory action. It inhibits cytokine production, interleukin 1, 6, and TNF alpha, reduces CRP level inhibits prostaglandin synthesis, inhibits leukocyte activation, and inhibits leukocyte migration. In this uh, prospective study carried out in population-based study carried out in Taiwan, it was seen that in SLE patients, the use of HCQ is associated with reduced risk of incident diabetes mellitus in a dose-dependent manner. High, on the other hand, in this, uh, uh, sorry, in this randomized double-blind parallel arm study, again, the HCQ was shown to improve both beta cell function and insulin sensitivity in non-diabetic individuals. These metabolic effects may explain the why HCQ treatment is associated with low risk of type 2 diabetes. Also, it has been shown to improve the adiponectin levels. So the HCQ has a very wide feature. And if, sure enough, the uh, hydroxychloroquine 400 milligram is approved by the Drug Controller General of India and recommended by RSSDI a Clinical Practice Recommendation 2017 as an add-on therapy after metformin, sulfonylurea, and type 2 diabetes mellitus patient. Well, what the, let's see the evidence with other drugs. Now, this uh, study was with the, with the methotrexate was started to determine whether anti-inflammatory therapy with a low-dose methotrexate targeting 15 to 20 milligram per week as compared with placebo will reduce the rate of recurrent cardiovascular events among patients with prior MI and type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Well, this trial was reported in 2019 by Paul M. Ridker et al. And this suggests it's told that the trial was stopped after a median of follow-up of 2.3 years as methotrexate did not result in lower interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6 or C-reactive protein level than placebo. Among patients, and it concluded that among patients with stable atherosclerosis, low dose methotrexis did not reduce level of interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6 or C protein, and did not result in fewer cardiovascular events than placebo. Then going to the bio biological uh, anti inflammatory uh, 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 therapy in type 2 diabetes, the TN alpha antagonists have been used to treat inflammatory conditions and have been associated with improved glycemic control and decreased incidence of diabetes, while more studies 
on patient with uh, with unfavorable cardiometabolic profile did not result uh, in uh, it, it did not demonstrate adequate result with exception of few people with a single randomized six month trial on the other hand large randomized trial with kenacunumab therapeutic monoclonal antibody targeting interleukin 1 beta the kentos trial over a median period of 3.7 years did not reduce the incidence of diabetes in patient with prior mi and high hsr uh, hsrp more than 2 mg per liter so to conclude uh, with ever increasing prevalence of diabetes uh, research need to be focused on its prevention as well as its treatment with better understanding of inflammation and the mechanism linking to it to diabetes and related complication we need to target inflammatory pathways as a part of the strategy to prevent diabetes and control diabetes and its complication <clears throat> though there is a strong uh, and a well established link between inflammation and diabetes and we need to do something to break this link thank you very much for a patient hearing